Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Good to see you here today. We appreciate your presence in the Northside Baptist Church. And you out in the radio listening audience, we appreciate the fact you've tuned in the Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium. Now, this is Preacher Edward speaking today. And we're hoping it can be a real inspiration to every one of you in the radio listening audience, as well as you here in the auditorium. I want you to take your Bibles today and turn to Matthew chapter 13 for the reading of God's Word. While you're turning there, I want to say to the radio listening audience, if you're not getting our daily broadcast, then tune in to this station where you're now listening at 12 o'clock noon each day, and you can get the daily broadcast Monday through Saturday. I hope you'll do that and tell others about it. This is a faith ministry. We depend upon you that love God and appreciate this ministry and can see the value and need of it to stand by us financially in getting out the Word of God. we we'll still be glad to send you the little guide on how to read your Bible through in a year as well as one of our beautiful 84 calendars at your request. Just write to us and request it. We'll get them in the mail to you. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia. 30603 is the zip code number. Now, if you're right to us, we we'll most certainly appreciate it. Then I want to say just this word to you in the radio listen audience that I've mailed out a brochure to in, in regard to our proposed Holy Land tour. I mailed out some brochures for some of you that's requested them. And if you haven't sent it in your answer, if you still plan to go with us to the Holy Land, then you must get information to me right away. Time is running out. And if you have that brochure and you want to go, then get in touch with me in the next week or so because time is running out on us. We plan to go in March, uh, leaving the 26th. The weather will be beautiful here. It will be beautiful over there. be a wonderful time to go. And if you have that brochure, read it over again, make up your mind, get in touch with me, and it'll be a real, real trip of a lifetime. So you turn down your Bible to uh, Matthew chapter 13. You know I've mentioned many times about the a joke called our criminal judicial system. It's a real joke in many ways. It's pathetic. It's ludicrous. And uh, to show you what I mean, this past week out in California, Los Angeles, there was a man out there that walked into the mayor's office and in cold-blooded murder killed the mayor and killed, he walked down the hallway and went into another office and killed another man the, on the committee there. And he killed two men in cold-blooded murder. And so when they tried the man, the lawyer said that the reason he committed those murders, he had just eaten too much junk food. And so they just gave him about five years. That is, they let him out. They let him out this week after he served five years in one day. They set him free. Now, the only thing I can figure out of that is they either selected that jury, the lawyers and the judge from the elect, select fruit from a uh, 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 group, rather, from the uh, insane asylum out there in uh, California. That must have been where they selected the jury and the lawyer that pleaded the case, the lawyers and the judge. Either they selected a solid group from the ACLU, either from one of the two, because to just give a man about five years for killing two people in cold-blooded murder and turning them loose, there must be something wrong somewhere. Somebody is off upstairs, and it's a joke. It's pathetic, it's ludicrous, and I contend that when this man goes out and eats some more junk food, according to what they said, he'll go out and kill somebody else. And I think the people that set him free, I think they ought to be charged with all the crimes that he'll commit Amen. whenever he eats some more junk food. Now, isn't that a shame and a disgrace to our judicial system in America? I'm ashamed of that. And other nations are laughing about the crazy uh, judicial system, the criminal judicial system that we have in America. I'm ashamed of it. It's rotten. It stinks to high heaven. Yeah. Would to God we had some men in authority could do something, would do something about it. It's a disgrace. It makes the 
law-abiding citizens in this nation bow their heads in shame. And that particular case, I'll tell you, I'm ashamed of it and of many others. And all good level-headed people with common sense, law-abiding citizens in this nation, they're also ashamed of it. So I tell you, beloved, it's something must be done about this in the future. Something has to be done about it. If not, we're going to have a war between the criminals and the law-abiding citizens in this nation in a matter of a few years. We're already having to put up bars now on our houses and doors and windows and stay behind bars while the criminal walks up and down the street. There used to be a time you'd put the bars on the jails and prisons and put the criminal in jail, but that's not true anymore. You've got to put the bars on your windows and on your house, on your doors, on your business because the criminal is out there walking around because of the rotten, stinking, dirty uh, judicial system we have in America today. Now, uh, you may say, Preach Edwards, I don't like it. I don't care if you don't. I'm telling you the truth anyhow, and you know it's true. You know that I'm giving you good common sense, and what I'm saying is true. You know that. And so I just want to make mention of it and remind you again today, lest you forget. And I'll probably, if God spares my life, remind you again along, because something has to be done about this are we in bad shape here in this country We're already in bad shape and it's going to get worse now if you have your bible open at matthew chapter 13 i want to begin reading today with verse 36 matthew 13 verse 36 page 1017 in the original schofield reference bible then jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tear of them is the devil, the harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the field, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them in the furnace of fire, and thou shalt be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as a son in the kingdom of their father, who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field, the which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy therefore goeth and setteth all that he hath, and buyeth the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who when he hath found one pearl of great price, and he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast in the sea and gathered of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but the, the bad they cast away. So shall it be at the end of the world. The angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just and cast them in the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Now while you have your Bible open there, I want to correct a mistake I made in number when I preached on the virgin birth found down in verse 55 of Matthew 13. I said Jesus had three brothers and at least two sisters born after he was born. I knew better. I don't know why I said three when I knew it was four. And verse 55 tells you they had four brothers and then at least two sisters after his birth. But I said in that message he had three. I made that error knowing that he had four and I don't know why I said three. But I did and that's on that tape in that message in case you secured the tape it's four instead of three that he had now go back with you please to matthew chapter 13 and look at verse 45 and the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man seeking goodly pearls who when he had found one pearl of great price went and sold all he had and bought it i'm going to speak to you today on the pearl of great price now you know what a pearl is a pearl oyster has been found that contained 620 pearls, 20 black pearls and 600 seed pearls. 
The oyster measured over four square inches, and this is a record. That's a large one, isn't it? That was a pearl found in Asia some time ago. The largest natural pearl was three inches long and nearly two inches thick. It was found by a Persian diver in 1628. It was sold to the emperor of Japan for his wife. Later, it ended up in China and was buried with the emperor of China. A hundred years later, it was stolen by grave robbers. For 18 years, it disappeared from public. And then it turned up in Hong Kong. It was sold to an unidentified buyer in Paris. It has been disappeared now since the late 1940s. Nobody knows where it is. That's the largest pearl ever found. And I want to speak to you today about this pearl of great price, which is uh, the church. It's telling you here in my text about the pearl of great price. And that pearl is the church of the living God, every true born again believer. Now the church is precious to the heart of God. Now the pearl is mentioned nine times in the New Testament. We read about pearls and we think about gems and diamonds and so forth. That was a young Jewish lad one time. He had a beautiful diamond on the lapel of his coat. So one, someone asked him why he, or where did he get such a beautiful pen like that and uh, had it on the lapel of his coat. He said, when my father died, he left in his will a letter telling me to be sure when he died to mount a beautiful stone and said that's what I did I have it here on the pale of my coat fifty thousand dollars worth now people appreciate the jewels and precious stones and so forth and we're talking about a pearl today and number one I want to mention the unity of a pearl now we know the church should be and remain in unity as we serve God in Galatians chapter 3 verses 26 through 29 for you're all the, the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many as you have been baptized into Christ and have put on Christ. He said there's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither male nor female. For you're all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ, then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So the Bible tells us in Christ Jesus we're all one. Bond of free, Jew or Gentile, man or woman, were all one in Christ. And that speaks of great unity in the body of Christ. A pearl is the only gem whose unity cannot be broken without destroying it. If you try to break that pearl, you destroy it completely. You can take a diamond and cut it in two and you have two diamonds. You could take a lump of gold and divide it and you have two lumps of gold. But if you cut a pearl in two, you have nothing. You completely destroy that pearl. So in the Bible, a pearl stands for the unity of the saints in this generation. That is in the body of Christ, in the Lord, placed in his body. We're all one in Christ Jesus. It cannot be divided. If so, it would be destroyed. So in the body of Christ, where you're placed the moment you're born again, we have unity in that body and we should have unity in our local assemblies that we call our church. And so there's unity in the pearl. There's also unity in the body of Christ. And then we come to our second thought, which is this. A pearl is a product of a living creature. It's the only gem that is. That pearl comes from the body of a living creature. It comes as a result of great suffering. Every pearl you see came as a result of great suffering from a living creature. Uh, way down in the ocean's depth, there lives a little animal encased in a shell. One day, a foreign substance, a grain of sand, intruded and pierced its side. Now, God had endowed that animal with the faculty of self-preservation like he has all creatures. And it throws out a slimy substance called nacre and covers the wound over and over again until there is built up a beautiful pearl. 
So down in the sea, that little animal down there, because it's been wounded by a grain of sand, something has penetrated its little body. It begins to spew out nacre and it covers that little wound. And then it continues to build up. And finally you will have from that a very beautiful pearl. How wonderful is this figure when it comes to the church of Jesus Christ. How accurate the emblem. In Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2, speaking about Jesus in regard to the pearl of great price, the church, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus, while upon the earth, persecuted, spat upon, beaten, whipped, there his beard plucked from his face, spittle in his beard, his hair pulled, beat upon his back, and there his back cut deep furrows upon his back, and there uh, nails placed in his hands and in his feet, and a spear in his side in the Garden of Gethsemane. There sweat as it were great drops of blood and soul agony. The Son of God in all of this agony and all the suffering looked forward to that time when his church, the pearl of great price, would be formed and turned over to him in his fullness. That's what kept him keeping on. He said, for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God until the pearl of great price is complete, which is the body of the bride of Christ, and then it will be turned over to him completely. But he suffered and agonized in order that you might have this pearl of great price in which you are part. Every true born again believer belongs to the body of Jesus Christ. You're part of this pearl. And you cannot be broken off. It's impossible. That's why I say a person can never be lost again. You can't chip off part of that pearl. You'd run the pearl. No saved person will ever be lost again. No saved person will ever go to hell. These people is preaching error. I uh, preach that you can be saved today and lost tomorrow. Don't know what the Bible teaches. Last Sunday night I went home and happened to turn on my TV to catch a little news or something. And I saw an outstanding evangelist among the charismatic movement. And he was going to expose false doctrine that Calvin taught and Augustine taught and some of the great church fathers taught. He was going to expose that false doctrine. And I listened to him for a few minutes and lo and behold, my soul, my soul, that man preached more false doctrine in trying to expose the false doctrine of Calvin and Augustine and others than they taught themselves. His message I heard, I couldn't stand much of it, but uh, what I did hear, he preached false doctrine just about all the way through what I heard him preach. Fallen from grace, said the man, a man was not depraved, the sinner was not depraved, right on and on. He preached false doctrine. It's pitiful. That man with the audience he has, it's a shame and it's pathetic that he doesn't know the Bible and rightly divide the word of truth. He takes a stand against sin. He preaches against sin. He has a good musical program. But when it comes to his preaching, he's so crossed up and mixed up in doctrine. It's, it's pathetic. It's a shame that the man couldn't rightly divide the word of truth with the opportunity he has. Now let's move on. Thought number three. The pearl is an object that is formed slowly and gradually. Down there in the sea... As that little animal, that little oyster begins to spew out that nacre and covers that little wound in his body, he does that over a period of time. That doesn't happen overnight. That doesn't happen in a day's time, a week's time, a month. Many times it goes on for months and years. There as he builds up that beautiful pearl. And so the church is not formed overnight. Out of each generation, God has taken out a few here and a few there and added to the church. The church was on dear son. It started back on the day of Pentecost with the apostles and, and Christ ahead in the foundation. And God has been placing on, adding on to that pearl out of every century, every century since that time, over 1900 years ago, he's been adding to that pearl. When you got saved, God added you to that pearl. God is building a 
pearl for his son Jesus Christ. And that pearl is the church of the living God. And it does it. It's not done overnight. The church is not built overnight. The church is built from the time it was organized and baptized into one body until the rapture takes place and the pearl will be complete and finished at that time. And it will be a pearl for our Savior. It will be his bride, of course. Then we move on to thought number four, and that is the slowly origin of that which is a type of the church. The slowly origin here of that which is a type of the church, it comes from the bottom of the sea. Not up on uh, the shore, not out to be seen on the grass or on the sand. Down in the bottom of this sea, the lowly origin of this pearl. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, you are called uncircumcised, that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time we were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in this world. God reached out to the Gentiles, the Jews, and the outcasts, the lowly, the curses, the drunks, the harlots, the adulterers, the gamblers, the curses. And God reaches out there and takes from among these people a person and saves him and washes him and makes him whiter than snow and makes him part of that beautiful pearl. This pearl is made up of people of all races and all kind and culture and whatnot is part of this great pearl of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's an old drunk in the gutter. God saves him, adds him to that pearl. There's a poor heart out there in the street. God saves her, adds her to that pearl. There's a gambler. God saves him. There's a cusser. God saves him, adds him to that pearl. And God is forming a pearl. And that's a lowly origin from which it comes according to the Bible. It's not made up of the elite, of the treetop society group, of the up and outs. It's made up of all people, even down and outs according to the Bible. Then we move on to thought number five. That is the pearl. As it's being formed down there in the ocean's depth, it is not seen by the eye of man. Man walks along the ocean shore and he doesn't see that pearl being formed down there in the bottom of that little oyster. It's down under the muck in the mind, the water. He can't see it. It is seen only by the eye of God. God sees that little oyster. God sees that little pearl. God sees the suffering of that little animal. In like amount of the church, which is the body of Christ, it's not seen being formed the world over by man. Only God sees the, the little pearl being formed from the day of Pentecost. Is somebody saved today yonder in uh, England? That's part of that pearl. If there's somebody saved in the Philippines, that's part of that pearl. If there's somebody saved in America, that's part of that pearl. Only God sees that. We might see it if it happened here outwardly, but God sees it as it's added to the body of Christ. And so only the Lord sees what's happening. In like manner, the church, which is the body of Christ, is brought out in that manner. In Ephesians 2, 21, and all whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord. God is building this building. Ephesians 4, 16, by whom the whole body fitly joins together, compacted by that which every joint of supplies according to the effects of work in the, in the measure of every part, maketh increase the body and the edifying of itself in love. God is doing that. Colossians 3, 3, for your dead in your life is hid with Christ in God. God sees every soul that saved. He does the saving. He has that pearl. The pearl is not found in the mine of the earth, but in the sea. And the sea is symbolic of the Gentile world. According to Revelation chapter 17 verse 15. I must hurry on. I want to get this message out to the radio listener. It's number 6. We learn from this figure that in the eyes of God. That the church is an object of value and beauty. As God sees the church being formed. It's an object of value. An object of beauty in the eyes of God. The Bible tells in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 10, When he shall come to be glorified in his saints, and to be a mind in all them that believe. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 27, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. In the eyes of God, he admires his church. He admires his pearl. He loves it. 
It's an object of beauty in the eyes of God. And Christ will come and display his glorified church in due time. That pearl is now being formed to the glory of God. Then we come to thought number seven, and that is, in this figure we can see the honorable and exalted future the church is yet to enjoy. Now we enjoy serving God down here. We enjoy the good fellowship. We enjoy the blessings. We enjoy being with each other. We enjoy the singing and the preaching. But beloved, that's yet a joy for the church of the living God that we can't describe waiting for us on the other side. Amen. Now you're talking about enjoying yourself and enjoying each other. You just wait till all of us get over there on the other side being part of that pearl of great price and throughout the ages to come Jesus Christ is going to show forth his church in ages to come and millions and millions of years in the future Jesus would say this is my pearl of great price and would be with him throughout the endless ages of eternity yeah, amen. this little object down in the depths of the ocean there has not seen a man but is gradually built up and sooner or later, this little pearl is taken out of that oyster that suffered day after day, week after week, month after month. And there produced that beautiful little pearl, that little pearl of great price being paid by that little oyster. It paid a terrible price to produce that pearl. That pearl after the oyster is taken up is taken out of its little body and then placed probably maybe in the crown of a king. Or it could be placed in the beads of a queen. See how it can be exalted and placed up on high there in the crown of a king or the bracelet or the beads of the necklace of a queen or on some of the great dignitaries of this world lifted out of that mud and out of the sand and underneath the trash and the water from a suffering a little oyster lifted out and shining beautifully in the crown of a king. That's what's going to happen to the church. God is calling out among the drunks and the wicked and the ungodly, a people for his name, and they're taken out. And there they become part of that pearl. And someday will be placed at the feet of Jesus and be by his side throughout the endless age of eternity. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 4. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall we also appear with him in glory. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 7, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 20, we are not our own, we have been bought with a price. That Austria paid a price for that pearl. We are not our own. God bought us with a tremendous price. With his own precious blood. The man here is Christ, the fillers of the world of my text. He desired this goodly pearl, it tells us. In Psalms chapter 45 and verse 11, So shall thy king greatly desire thy beauty. We find he regarded this pearl of being of great price. In Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 31, Then I was by him as one brought up with him I was his daily delight and then he sold all that he had and bought this pearl the Bible said he became poor talking about Christ that through his poverty we might be made rich and the Bible said he sought this pearl this man went out seeking this pearl sought out the pearl found the pearl the Bible says in Luke chapter 19 and verse 10, he came to seek and to save that which is lost. Then the Bible says he bought it. Jesus bought it, not only suffered for it, but he bought it. And he did not buy this pearl with silver and gold. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 and 19, he bought this with the precious blood of his son Jesus Christ. So you sit here today as part of that pearl of great price that's been bought with the suffering and mainly with the blood, the blood of God's Son, Jesus Christ. You are somebody. You are part of that pearl of great price. And throughout the ages to come, God's going to show you off 
throughout the endless age of eternity, but he's going to completely form the pearl before it's lifted out. And when it is complete, he'll come in the clouds with great glory and a great shout and the voice of the archangel, and out will go the pearl to meet him in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. How we thank God for being part of the pearl of great price. God bless you. You've listened well. I appreciate it. So stand to your feet. Our Father, I pray today that you'll take the message and use it. We thank you, dear God, that we're part of the pearl of great price. Thank you, Lord God. Back yonder many years ago, you add this to that pearl. We're part of it. Bless thy people. They use this message. Speak to every heart. May your name be honored. I pray in Jesus' name and for his sake with thanksgiving. Amen. Debbie's going to play for us as she plays on their instrument. If you're in this building, unsaved, backslidden, need to join the church or whatever, if God is speaking to your heart, come down here and let us help you. Will you? I'm right here to help you. I'd gladly do so while she plays on this. Will you come? <laughs> 